Good day everyone and welcome to this talk concerning the Imu Porphyry Copper Deposit in Western Highlands, New Guinea. My name is Tim Island and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues Rob Sivright um, and a whole bunch of other people there, notably Mark Io and John Dobe from Footprint Resources who ultimately own the project. Imu is a curious porphyry um, primarily because it's got these amazing quartz magnetite stockworks sticking out of the ground. Um, which turn out not to be the main residents of, of the target metals in the system. So to explore that, we're going to run through a, a, a little bit of a descriptive summary of the, of the deposit, and then hopefully we'll get to a bit of discussion at the end as to what's going on. So where is it? Like I said, it's located in Western Highlands, New Guinea. It's a long structural strike between Frida River and Yandera, Fairly, both fairly, quite famous deposits, although it's slightly younger than those than those two deposits and is close in time to Kainan to um, yet further to the east. Um, now, like else to say, we'll get to um, get to the geology in a second. This part of the world has been explored for at least forty, perhaps even fifty years now, um, for good reason. Uh, it sits at a, a major inflection of of a, a primary arc parallel fault system um, and there are a series of, of tertiary porphyritic intrusive complexes more than half of which are associated with with gold and or copper um, anomalism and mineralization um, there's also some quite significant alluvial gold development along the april river downstream of imu um, although in the context of this of this what is a broadly fertile district, Imu stands out for its the strength of its copper anomalism um, among a lot more, more, far more widespread gold anomalism in the district. So here is just highlighting the locations of some of the other prospects. And here's a geologic map in which we can see that the hinterland geology is primarily made up of uh, bits of seafloor, uh, mafic and ultramafic rocks here in purple, and related um, deep marine fine grained siliciclastic sediments in, in the green tones. And then into that ophiolitic mess have been in place a series of small intermediate composition intrusions, none of which are more than a couple of kilometres across or up to three or four kilometres across. Um, but know that there are no, no major batholithic intrusions uh, known in the region. If we take a look at the regional sort of geologic picture through the prism of magnetics. Um, the rocks themselves are magnetic. They're all magnetite series intrusions, um, fairly classic texturally, mineralogically. Um, but at the, at the scale of the regional mag magnetic um, anomaly map, the deposit itself, highlighted in the little white outline um, toward the bottom of the mag map, um, isn't a standout magnetic feature. Um, because the regional magnetic signature is dominated by the serpentinized um, parts of the ophiolite um, or parts of the abducted complex. Um, if we look at where some of the other prospects are as well, we see that none of them really have much by way of distinctive magnetic character. Um, and equally that in line with the geologic map, there's no, there's no evidence in the magnetics for large, effectively blind um, magnetic intrusions. In terms of magma chemistry, I said before, these are fairly, mineralogically fairly standard pledge horn blend magnetite rocks. They locally contain biotite or, and subordinate quartz. Um, they're a bit unusual in compared to other gold and copper bearing porphyry systems because they're relatively low K, um, low to mid K calc alkaline rocks. Um, and very strangely, the, the earlier rocks, the, the things labeled IDD in the left-hand photograph and colored red on both the charts, um, are slightly more felsic than the porphyritic phases um, and also uh, seem to be more fertile, um, at least insofar as we, we might in, infer fertility from, from whole rock proxies such as strontium over yttrium. Um, and then the younger rocks are correspondingly slightly more mafic and slightly less fertile looking on the whole. They're emplaced in ultimately three pulses. Um, the earliest evidence of crystallization takes the form of a series of antichrists in one of the porphyries. Um, 
the more equigranular rocks appear to have been placed around about 8.4 million years ago. And then the porphyries range in age, but at least seem to be locally mutually cross-cutting, um, in which case they, they represent a, a phase of intrusion around about 7.9 MA. And we can t put those three episodes together and draw a conclusion that the, the mag magnetism occurred here over a period of around about 700,000 years as a minimum duration, um, but probably no longer than 2 million years. We looked at the, the, the chemistry of the zircons that were analysed for chronology. Um, on the whole, the, the trace element composition of, uh, of the zircons that we would use to imply the overall nature of the coexisting magma um, suggests that this was, was relatively hot, that these, these zircons crystallised um, above 725 degrees. Um, the range of bulk hafnium is, is relatively short and the uranium, titanium and thorium uranium ratios are very consistent and stable throughout all of these samples, suggesting that uh, they don't represent um, protracted fractionation or evolution of a, of a common magma chamber. And hence my, my comment here that with a question mark, was this uh, or is this evidence for a short and relatively hot evolution? Um, however, the the, the zircon chemical proxies that we might use to infer um, hydrous or equilibrium with, with a hydrous and oxidized magnetic environment, um, Europe, European star and dysprosium ytterbium, the results for those kinds of proxies are uniformly strong in this system, um, which comes as no surprise because they're magnetite series rocks and the horn blend is the dominant ferromagnesian phase. Let's get on to the hydrothermal aspects of the system. We see banded quartz magnetite veins. This is left to right from earliest to, to latest. Classic B veins, some fairly classic barren quartz veins from one of our deepest drill holes. It's notable that there are no banded quartz moly veins here. And instead the moly, albeit at low levels, resides with this group of um, fracture paints and sulfide and hydrite veins and vein brechets, which are the um, the key to grade distribution in the system. Um, and then there's a very late, pretty classic philic event, um, structurally controlled classic D veins that cuts across that. I, I mentioned there's something about grade association with um, uh, with the different vein styles. Um, I've got some, some downhole logs here showing copper gold moly in, and then in, in orange I've got the, the A and B vein abundance and in pink the, the sulphide and sulphide and hydrite vein abundance. And the observation I want to take away is as down here at the lower part of the second hole, um, in the centre of the fourth hole, we see grade primarily associated with, with that sulphide and hydrite stage. Um, and although where we see strong A vein development, uh, we do also occasionally see some grade, for example, through here. Um, the best grade and certainly the most consistent grade is associated with the sulfide uh, stage. Here's a, some maps just to show the distribution of bits and pieces. Um, the point I really want to make with this is you know, I've, I've hashed on there on the right hand pane the distribution of uh, magnetite cemented hydrothermal breaches and strong albite chloride alteration and that's roughly central to the geochemical and and mappable alteration facies of the system for which note here the the primary alteration assemblages in the high temperature part of the system are recorded as albite magnetite and albite magnetite chloride um, and we, although we um, and that conventional potassic alteration is relatively scarce if we look at some rocks in detail, it supports that idea. Uh, here we've got a test scan image showing some false colour mineralogy. The point to take away here is that there are no potassium minerals. There are, and it's reflected in the whole rock chemistry as well. The alteration associated with the system really is an albite chloride assemblage. Here's another one. You can see quartz veins in grey, sulphide veins cutting across those. And the alteration in the background is comprised of 
chlorite plus minus albite plus or minus muscovite. So I've been telling you about the deposit and this is really the takeaway. There's, there's not very much copper and gold in the, associated with the prograde alteration and the, the A-type veins. And, and why is that? Um, we, we batted this around. And I'm, I'm not presenting you any kind of fait accompli um, agreed end product answer here. We asked, you know, is it a function of oxidation state? Was the thing too oxidized? That there's so much magnetite, was there not enough, not enough sulfide to stabilize sulfide minerals and and cause a precipitation of the target metals? But that seems unlikely because it's not a hematite stable system as with some alkaline porphyries. So what about temperature? We showed that the zircon chemistry seemed to imply that the magma is crystallized a little hotter than other porphyries. But on the flip side, we also looked at the magnetite chemistry. And the chemistry of the magnetite in the system is more consistent with that in lower temperature things such as BIF and ICG. Um, so we're a bit confused then about how to reconcile arguably hotter magma with cooler fluids. Um, and really our best guess as to what the possible, I guess, rate limiting step might be in this system is that the evolution of the magma seems a little underdone, if you like. Uh, the overall magmatic duration is, is relatively short. We can't point at any evidence for a large staging chamber um, of any sort, neither in the map pattern or implied by the regional magnetic survey. Um, and then and the, the proof of that, or perhaps the, the symptom of, of a half-baked magmatic development is the lack of potassium um, associated with the silicate alteration. So we see albite chloride in where we would expect to see biotite and K-feldspar. Um, and so we wonder then, was the brine a bit short on the, the key salts that it needed to, to allow for good metal solubility? Um, I'm not entirely convinced I believe that because then later on in the parogenesis, it's very effectively um, mobilized copper and gold. Um, and so perhaps that that limited magmatic evolution or some part of the magmatic evolution has meant that the, the sulfur flux at the time of uh, fluid exolution from the magma was somewhat insufficient. Nonetheless, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. And um, I look forward to discussing um, with any, anyone who's interested the, um, the somewhat curious Imu porphyry copper gold deposit. Thanks.